Hi, I'm Kevin Hicks and welcome to my channel, The History Squad. And today, in part four of our series, we're looking at the Battle of Cressy. Now, if you've seen part three of this series, our Hundred Years War series, I mentioned about uh, having some of the Perry miniatures, the little soldiers sent over from the UK. Well, they arrived. They've taken an age to paint, but we've now got them. So they will help us describe to you the Battle of Cressy. So the army's moved on from Blanchetec. They've all been resupplied. The army now is moving up to Pointu. This is the ground, the land of Edward III's grandmother. He felt as if he belonged to the land. And he moves his army into the forest of Cressy. He reconnoitres the ground. He looks over the ground. Reconnaissance. You see, this king, he was not just, in my opinion, a bit of a genius when it comes to logistics. He also had an incredibly powerful spy network. His intelligence network was far better than the French, and yet he was in enemy territory. He knew where the French were. They'd gone in a, a slightly different uh, direction, but he was counting that they would come for him. But he's got time now to have a good look around and choose the ground which he already knew. Now, the day before Cressy, the 25th of August, his army is in the forest of Cressy. They've not moved into position just yet. They're resting because they travelled over 300 miles in 30-odd days. Yeah, an entire army with wagon trains, roughly 10 miles a day. Wow. Cooks, tailors, tent makers, the ladies, you name it in that wagon train. So the Battle of Cressy, 1346. Wow. The English are there. They're ready. It's first thing in the morning. Everybody gets up and the king is about them. This is quite incredible because the ground itself, it falls away quite sharply um, in length down to where the French will come in. It's about 2,000 yards. And across, the battlefield is quite extensive, well over 2,000 yards. It's bracketed on one side, on the right of the English, by the village of Cressy, and then further over by the smaller village of Wadicourt. But it's the topography, the shape of the land. Apparently there were terraces where the farmers farmed the ground, but we, we've got no trace of them. But the closer you get up, there is a sudden rise as you get up towards the English. The king knew this. He surveyed it. And then the king himself, on a simple palfrey, on a simple pony, if you like, unarmoured except for his sword, places his troops himself. He forms his men-at-arms in the centre at two points. Either side, they are bracketed by bowmen. These are formed in what's called the hearse shape. This means that they can enfilade or shoot across into the enemy and support each other. This is the beginning of a new kind of warfare which will be known as the English way or the English system. The king has his reserves behind, then there's the woods behind, but there's another thing to this battlefield. Not only have you got these terraces and goodness knows what in the way, it's the way it's shaped because on the English left here, the Valley de Clercs is so steep that horses will have difficulty, almost impossible, for horses to charge up it. So the French will be drawn to the centre here, to the centre of the Prince of Wales division, which is ideal for Edward III because he has his artillery placed here. And if anything happens, he can bring troops across. This is how the king laid his troops. Now what we've done with the model is, is we've, we've just shown you one tiny part of the battlefield uh, out on the English right wing there and we'll describe this as, as we go through but the king placed the troops and their sections himself all morning he is doing this meanwhile the French are nowhere to be seen obviously we have scouts out and he has somebody sat at the top of the windmill to keep an eye out to see what they can see because on this ridge was the famous windmill, which gave the king an absolute panoramic view 
of the whole scene. Now, in the woods to behind the English, you have the wagon train, the, the legged up wagons, the supply chain, everything is going to go perfect. And then the bowmen are simply told, lay down your arms where you stand and then go and dig holes in front of your position. Thousands of holes are dug. Not great big pits. These are just holes to trip the horses. This is savage, isn't it? Yeah. The holes are dug. Everybody's ready. Everybody's in their position. And uh, the French aren't there. So the English, twiddling their thumbs, are going to be fed from the central kitchen. They are ordered, company by company, leave their arms where they are, go and collect their food, bring it back, and then sit down in your place. This is incredible. And then the king has his grand review. It's, it's in the middle of the day sometime where the army stands up ready and the king himself reviews his entire army. That's 15,000 men, 7,000 bowmen, right? And then collectively round about 15,000 men. He reviews the lot. It's said to be the greatest, most important review of an army in history. The reason being, if he lost, he could lose his kingdom. All afternoon, the English army simply sit down, all waiting for the trumpets to sound the arrival of the French. That is, if the French arrive, the king has gambled. If the French arrive, it's his ground. It's his choosing. And the French arrive. But not until around four o'clock in the afternoon. There'd already been a rainstorm. And this, this kind of shows you what, what the English and the Welsh bowmen, because there's got to be one or two there at least, yeah? They ran to their bows, de-string them, put the, bo the bow strings under their helmets, yeah, under their hats, keep them dry. But coming towards the English, of course, are the Genoese crossbowmen. They can't take off their bow strings. They'll be soaking wet. And they are so tensioned that when you actually draw them back, they will stretch. This will lessen the range. So around four o'clock, the French actually arrive on the battlefield. Their foremost, the front of their army, what's called a vanguard, is the Genoese crossbowmen. As they pull onto the battlefield, they wheel to their left, and there they face the Prince of Wales division. They are not ready to form up, and yet behind them are heavily armoured cavalry. The Genoese were the most disciplined force that the French had on the battlefield. This is without a doubt. They could manoeuvre, they could move, but they needed time to sort themselves out. For instance, way back in the French army, all of the massive shields and the men who carried them, the pavisseurs and the pavises, were actually stored in wagons. Yeah, so they needed to be brought forward. But instead, Alençon, the Duke of Alençon, he actually pushes. He wants to get on and fight the English, but it's so late in the afternoon. The king has taken advice. Um, yeah, we should actually reconnoiter the area we should perhaps wait until the morning the english are certainly waiting for the french to do that but no alençon goes against the french king's orders the genoese are pushed forward their ranks are ragged because they're trying to get over this terrain they stop they pause three times to order their ranks they're professional soldiers on the Third stand, all hell breaks loose. You see what these Genoese have been doing is they've been shooting bolts up the hill to gauge the range. The English could also see where those bolts were landing. And they knew when the Genoese made their third stand, they could outrange them. The sky turned black. Those poor Genoese soldiers without the protection of their shields, their pavis, they didn't stand a chance. Men span round with arrows through them. Men fell to the ground, screaming in absolute agony. And then, cracks of thunder, shoots of flame like dragon's breath. The king's secret weapon. 
his cannons, the first time they had actually been used in open battle. As these iron balls shot through the Genoese bowmen, the arrows raining into them, they were in agony. They began to fall back, but the French behind them believed them to be traitors, cowards. Here develops a battle within the battle. Now I've read so many different accounts, but what I've seen in the, in the words is this. The French cavalry begin to ride down the Genoese, believing them to be cowards and traitors. The Genoese, in turn, turn on some of the knights, shooting them at close range. Eventually, the horses break through the Genoese, who filter off the battlefield. The charge, now led by Alençon, gains momentum. But they haven't reconnoitred. They don't know the terrain. They're coming up the hill. There are bowmen in their hearse on the left and right who are going to shoot from each side, enfilade them with arrows, pouring the arrows into those poor horses. And then, wallop, the horses encounter the holes. Horses' legs snap. They actually catapult into the air. But still, the knights ride into the English. They get as close as the Prince of Wales himself, where Alanson is killed. Legend says he managed to strike one blow, but I doubt it. Now the English men-at-arms with the Prince of Wales wade in to the knights trapped on their horses. Sheer carnage. But already the ground is beginning to tremble with another charge coming up the hill because they can't see just over the lip of the hill what's really going on. And on they come and now the bowmen still being resupplied. The wives hand the arrows to the kids who run them into the bowmen. This is fantastic the way it actually works. Wave after wave of horses are coming in and those horses are being riddled with arrows. But the French really did get to grips with our men-at-arms. The uh, Prince of Wales division was pushed back slightly. Uh, at one stage, they wanted to reinforce the uh, Prince of Wales division. This is a boy, uh, 16, 17 years of age, he's fighting for his life. So the king was asked, you know, can you send some knights? Apparently he sent 20. Uh, but he says, let the boy earn his spurs. Wow. The boy earned his spurs. They reckon there was something like 1,700 French knights and men-at-arms around the Prince of Wales division at the end of the battle. But coming up the hill, he's a brave old soldier. Yeah, John of Luxembourg, King of Bohemia. What a guy. Blind. Tether my horse to yours so I might strike one last blow against the English, or worse to that effect. And he charged up the hill, and he was killed. Now the French charged throughout the evening into darkness. Fifteen times they charged, not knowing about the carnage on top of the hill. King Philip of France, he wanted to charge, but his bridle was pulled aside, and he was led off the battlefield. Eventually, the French army simply melts away. It has lost the day. Edward III, meanwhile, sends a reconnaissance force out. Where has the French army gone? Are they a threat? I think it was the Earl of Warwick and Northampton. They go down the battlefield to see what's happened to the French army. But coming the other way in the darkness are French reinforcements who believe the army in front of them to be their allies or the, the French, but they're not, it's the English. And the English attack them. It resulted in over 2,000 French dead. The English, they say, lost two knights, up to 70 men-at-arms and bowmen. The French, we will never know the true losses of the French, because they did not count their common dead. The numbers were around 7,500 noble French and men-at-arms. A disaster for the French and an incredible victory for Edward III, who in my book is one of the greatest kings we English ever had. So, I hope you've enjoyed our little film about the Battle of Cressy. If you have, thumbs up. If you're a subscriber already, hey, Thanks a million and keep those comments coming because we're having a great deal of fun going through them. 
Brilliant, thank you. If you're not a subscriber, then hey, subscribe, ding that bell, and join in some of these history forums because they are, I will be honest with you, great fun. Now, if you've missed any of the series, you can catch up by pressing the playlist here, and there's also a link in the description. So, thank you very much, and bye for now.